Good evening, campers. It's me, Kieran. Today we are going to talk about Anne Bronte's The Tenant of Wildfeld Hall. Anne Bronte is probably the least well-known out of the Bronte sisters, and I think after reading this, I know why. <laughs> Um, so I'll preface this by saying that the Victorians had a knack for melodrama. Everything's heightened, everything's hyperbolized, uh, and the Tenant of Winefell Hall does that to a T. No character within this novel is vaguely emotional. Everything's like ratcheted up to the nth degree. And it doesn't help that Bronte in part tells this story through diary entries. This is part epistolary novel. And as we say on this channel, the epistolary is the junk mail of literature. I might as well be brash because this novel has no time for subtlety. We open up the novel, a mysterious woman and her son enter a town folk and her aloofness gains her some curiosity and also disdain from the villager. Apart from Mr. Markham who is enraptured and captivated by mostly the looks of this woman rather than her aloofness. This opening is very akin to her sister Emily's Wuthering Heights. There's something a little bit odd with the situation but then the story changes to this lady's perspective. It's downhill all the way with this story. We learn that this woman called Helen fell in love with a man called Arthur and was besotted and beseeched with him. Even though to the disdain of her aunt, who advises she should not marry Arthur, she has rose tinted glasses and decides to marry him. And there we have a tumultuous and violent marriage. Now, I'm no expert within this area and it could be that this novel was the first of its kind in discussing unhappy marriages and domestic violence and even though Helen feels as though she can change Arthur for the better, ultimately he mistreats her and controls her the more throughout this novel. But the problem here is that this novel is very much on the nose. You you are meant to know that it is bad. It is bad, 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 bad. And the good guys are very good, 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 good. But while the messaging of this plot is important and the way in which this book is structured is intriguing, it is so insufferably self-righteous. And because the way that Bronte has made all the characters, their interaction and their speech, melodramatic and unwavering in their beliefs and within their thoughts, this ultimately becomes farcical. And while I'm personally sympathetic of the situation, I'm unempathetic towards any of the characters. Even when Helen realizes that Arthur is corrupting their son, and that's the reason why she needs to leave, ultimately feels very obvious in some ways, not only because that's how the book opens, but there is no nuance. There, it's very, it's very stark. It's very black and white, this novel, which is ironic because, because of all the painting talk. This book made me feel in the same way that, excuse the comparison, Aobami Andy Bayo's A Spell of Good Things. I'll link that review down below. In the fact that I understand what the author's doing, but we move into scenes that are that are meant to get an emotional response to you, but they're done so heavy-handed, and this book is so melodramatic that nothing helps. And I'm uh, in the Testaments Club, two out of ten. I'm glad she wrote one book. Meditin, I've realised she wrote Agnes Grey. Um, that's a shame, isn't it? She wrote another one. Oh, maybe I'll give her a go next year. 